Baker, uh, and thank you, Ray, for the introduction. Um, and as Ray said, I was uh, tasked <coughs> with um, challenging you. So I think, is this where the questions come in? Of quick, quick, quick questions uh, regarding uh, Jim's presentation that he's going to. So let me just put it over to the main screen here. And if you'll pick up one of those clickers, one of those expressions over to the side, uh, we'll kick on to our first question. You'll notice on the expressions there's a small on button that's right down in the bottom right hand corner. If you just hold that button down, it'll fire up. And our first question. Will schools exist in a hundred years? Will schools exist in a hundred years? And we'll see, let me just kick on this scale here. One through five, and you'll notice it on the air. And what you want to do is you want to, and Eric and Tracy are floating around, you want to toggle back and forth from your middle dial, select your choice, and then you'll notice down in the bottom window it says send and you hit your choice and I see some votes coming right across right now. We'll give it just a second more. So you're going to toggle to your choice. Closing this down in three. Don't worry, this is not, we won't hold you to these results. Three, two, and one, there'll be another question coming up. Looks like, uh, looks like Dr. Bauer, we're all over, but most people feel totally agree to option two, somewhat agree. You got about 60% of us feeling that it's right in that uh, location for our results and such like that. Question number two to ask. Question number two, who was the first person to go and select, uh, warn us about textbooks. Was it, I'm kicking on the votes right here, was it the textbook, textbook terminator, Arnold, Descartes, the speaker, Socrates, or Maria Montessari? And we'll give you a second to respond on that. Whoops. There you go, my mistake, sorry about that. You should have a multiple choice. Again, make your selection and then hit the send button in the bottom of the screen. We have a few choices coming across now. Nobody likes to get the question wrong, so everybody's focused very hard. Okay, we'll close this one down in three and two and one. You'll have opportunity later on to throw it in there. Now, looks like the heavy favorite right now is between Socrates and Maria Montessari. However, there is somebody out in the crowd that believes the textbook Terminator, Arnold, is the key. Now, I, I know you're not going to share the answers with us right as of yet. Is that correct? That's correct. Good teaching practice means I never give answers. Okay, I'll kick it back over to you. Good, so as I said, I'm very happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> just curious, how many of you play lead guitar? Uh, backup singers? Uh, rhythm guitar? Good. So tomorrow, so fiddle. Uh, I think that's a song. Um, <clears throat> yeah, fiddle. Good, so it sounds like tomorrow night's gonna be interesting. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, how I'd like you to communicate with me. You can do it while I'm talking. And also, I think there's a session at, at 10 or 10.15 where we'll actually get together, I think, probably in a smaller group to talk about some of the things I'm going to be talking about here. So you and also, there are numbers of other people in the rest of the world who probably will be watching comments you're making as I'm speaking and trying to figure out what I might be saying today, because you never know. Um, so anyway, you can uh, go ahead and use, uh, you know, if you're, if you're Twitterers or tweets uh, or twits, I've heard it said all three ways, <coughs> um, you can go ahead and use that mechanism to communicate with me. That's me, by the way, as I appear in Wyville. 
Um, I'm, in Wyville, I'm known as Super Id. Uh, actually, the kids think it's Super ID, and I don't correct them because we have a lot of 12 year olds and I don't want them reading Freud. Um, <clears throat> so, originally, I was going to talk about something completely different, and then I decided uh, last night that I would talk about this, given that it's the uh, subject of your present or of your conference or the theme of your conference. What I was going to talk about, and I'd actually be happy to talk about later, I've actually been involved in teacher education programs for a long time, and I think that there are a lot of, as you know, a lot of interesting changes and opportunities now, especially in with technology for teacher education. I'm only going to touch on that a little bit. Uh, instead, what I thought I'd do is focus on the exponential theme. And as it was already mentioned uh, this morning, and as you all know, you are, we are living in exponential times. Here are some numbers. Uh, in computing power, for example, we are on an exponential curve. This is Moore's Law. Probably most of you are familiar with Moore's Law. By the way, I note I'm a computational neuroscientist. I don't usually mention that in educational conferences because people might have the impression I know something about the brain and learning, uh, which I wouldn't want to claim. Um, however, one of the interesting things about computing and people thinking about computing for many years is that for some reason they always feel under obligation to compare the computers we build to brains. So you see on the right side there um, that we're approaching uh, the computational power of a single insect. Uh, shortly thereafter we will be at the level of the mouse and then in the human and by 2060, we will actually be able to have the same computing power in computers that all human brains have together. So this is not a question that Promethean asked, but I'm going to ask you now, how many of you think that's nonsense? <laughs> Good. By the way, one point I'll make about the insect brain, I've been in this business now for 30 years as a computational neurobiologist, and it turns out we're always right on the edge of getting the insect brain. But then as time goes on, the insect brain moves up, and our computing keeps going, so anyway. <clears throat> but clearly we know computing power is, is growing exponentially, and that is, makes for all sorts of opportunities, in fact, enormous opportunities. Here's another one which, as teachers and teacher educators, you guys are in the middle of for sure, and that is the growth of new technology. This is actually a log plot showing the number of patents in the United States, which is growing exponentially. So not only is the computer power growing, but the ki especially the kinds of devices that this power allows you to make and the sorts of things it allows you to do are also growing exponentially, as seen in, in patents. Here's another one that I think is interesting, another exponential we're all on. This is an interesting plot. It describes how long it took after the introduction of a technology for one quarter of the Americans, people in the United States, to adopt the technology. So the telephone was actually invented before 1880, but it took about 50 years for one quarter of Americans to actually have telephones. If you look at that curve, you see the web Okay, at this end of that curb, which was introduced more or less in the 1990s, okay, and the amount of time that it took one quarter of Americans to start using the web was a very short period of time. In fact, from the World Bank, this is the curve for the United States of people in the United States getting on the internet. And you can see from the mid-1990s till about uh, 2005, two th or about 2000, 2002, we were on an exponential curve. It's now flattening out because we're running out of humans in the United States. Okay? We're doing as much as we can about that in Texas, by the way. All right? I'm personally doing as much as I possibly can about that. It's a biological imperative. But we are now reaching you know, an asymptote because we're simply running out of humans. If you look at the rest of the world, however, and this is uh, February 2011 data from the World Bank, you can see that the rest of the world is also 
headed in the same direction, and several of these different regions are now hitting exponential again in terms of growth of, of use of the internet. And of course, as was already mentioned, smartphones uh, and mobile technology is the reason this is happening. As all of you know, and probably a number of you have joked about, this includes kids too. In fact, it especially includes kids, right? How many of you have heard of Wyville? Oh, well, that's great. You just told them, that's right, prior to, but, but they weren't listening to you, Ray, because, you know, who does? Anyway, um, <clears throat> good. Well, if this were a room of 12 year olds, it would have been more like 60 or 70% probably, okay? So 12 year olds know about Wyville, and 12 year olds know about the internet. In fact, I watch large numbers of 12 year olds and how they use the internet, and then I talk to adults about the internet, and it turns out there's a definite disparity in terms of understanding. Um, <clears throat> so kids are definitely uh, driving this and are adopting this technology very quickly, which puts teachers in an interesting position, <clears throat> right? What does it take today to be the perfect online teacher, right? I think what you do is you find out from your 12-year-old what the latest thing it is. You get on it as fast as you can, but then as soon as you get on it, they get off it, right? So this is clearly a challenge. How does education connect to this huge growth in technology and computing power and connectivity? But here actually I think is the biggest challenge in terms of living in exponential times. These are projections on the world's population, okay? Starting back a long time ago, it shows the growth in human population from BC to the present day and out about 10 or 15 years. That's a serious exponential growth with rather serious consequences, potentially. One of the immediate consequences for education is that, along with economic issues, which are related to that growth, is that the number of t classes, the number of kids in classes is going up in the United States, for sure. These, this is actually data from uh, New York City schools over the last few years, and this is uh, K-5 classes. So we have a huge growth in humans that's been going on for a while and it's going to continue to accelerate, it looks like, barring pandemic. And I could stop here and talk about that, but uh, then it, that's not the way to start a conference. Um, <clears throat> so what this really means, if you take the growth in humans, okay, the numbers of humans, the growth in all this technology, is that we're confronting a scalability problem. How do you educate growing numbers of people connected, who are connected now, who are using this technology and stay in front of that? How do you do it? And so I wanted to do, and I think an introductory keynote on serious issues, it's actually often useful to look at history. So I think it's instructive to look back to when all of this started, arguably. Okay, which was actually around 1000 AD. This is the growth curve, human population, starting BCE and up to the present time. And the arrows that I've indicated are really when we started on this serious rise in terms of the number of humans in the world. Okay. And scalability, that is how do a relatively small number of educated people educate a growing number of humans is a serious problem for education. And it was a serious problem then. Do you know how it was solved then? We created universities. Okay? These are actually the times of creation of the universities that in those countries are the oldest, oldest universities in those countries. Okay? England was actually the first to put together what we now regard as university structure. 
okay? And these are some of the other European countries. And I know there are a lot of countries represented here besides uh, Western countries, but these are the European countries. And the, which, and the university was really a, kind of a European invention. So <clears throat> this is when universities came into existence. What do universities do, right? They have one professor at the front of the room who then educates a bunch of people sitting in the room, right? In current universities, UT Austin, UT San Antonio, where I teach, it can be as many as one professor to 600 students in a classroom. That's true scalability. And it works great. Or maybe not. Anyway. <clears throat> So what about education? So that's the that's the form of education that was invented during this period of time when the number of humans was going up. There were a lot of other things happening at that period of time as well, including the invention of new educational technology. This time, import again, this is Western history, but this time was particularly important for education because it was also the period of time when we developed what was called, what is now called manuscript, manuscript culture. One of the things the universities produced, this will shock you, is textbooks. Okay? Around the 12, 1300s, when prior to that, the people in charge of written language were monks in the Western, uh, Western world, who actually mostly translated previously existing manuscripts into new manuscripts. In fact, there was a very strong uh, aversion to changing anything. It was mostly about copying as precisely as you could from one manuscript to the next manuscript to the next manuscript, which introduced, you know, in, in schools sometimes we play the whisper game where one kid says something, the next kid says something, the next kid says something, the next kid. Well, that was what was going on in prior to the, the, um, the beginning of manuscript culture as well. What was happening was one monk would partially incorrectly transfer something and then the next monk would and the next monk would. It was a mess. Universities stepped in, because they're very good at this sort of thing, getting the other committees to decide what information should and shouldn't be in books. And then as long as you only have one discipline in the room, it really uh, goes well. But then as soon as you have a chemist and a biologist and a physicist, they start arguing about what's really important uh, information, and then you know how that goes. It turns into national standards eventually. Um, <clears throat> anyway, one of the things <clears throat> that happened in what's known as the late manuscript era was these things were invented for books. Things like a table of contents, lists of chapters, running headlines, page numbers, subject indices. These were inventions that came about once universities got in the business of producing textbooks. The other thing that textbook that these books became were facts-based. An effort, instead of just co co copying religious texts, an effort to actually put facts and all the facts we knew into a book which then became the basis for the university teaching, right? To this day, I'm often asked when I talk about different ways of teaching, okay, one of the things that my colleagues complain about endlessly is that the kids never read the book before they come to class. They never read chapter three before they come to class. And I always ask the question, why would you? They're gonna be hearing about chapter three in class. Except it's not chapter three, it's what the professor thinks chapter three says. Which turns out to be much more useful than what's in chapter three, because the guy in chapter three doesn't make up the test at the end of the class, the professor does. Right? So endlessly for years, faculty complaining that kids don't read the chapter before they come to class, why would you? Right? Makes no sense. What that means is, do we really haven't figured out how to merge the textbook with the class over the last 600 years, right? There's still this disconnect between published 
facts and lecturing and me standing in front of 600 kids and education. This is disconnect. It doesn't work very well. Okay. One other thing, of course, that happened late in this phase was the invention of new technology, the printing press. I would argue, as I just said, that we still haven't figured out how to really use the printing press in education effectively. Right? There's a conflict between the chapter. Of course, if the professor writes the book, then it ends up being that the chapter usually lines up better to what the professor thinks is going on. But um, anyway, that means professors should all write their own books, which these days with e-books they're starting to do, which scares the heck out of me. But anyway. <coughs> What was the consequence of this in human society? The Renaissance and the Reformation, which can be traced directly back to this new form of communication, which was the textbooks and books in general and printing books. The way the referendum spread was through printed pamphlets. Guaranteed, if the monks had still been printing the pamphlets, it probably wouldn't have happened. Okay? Similarly, the Renaissance, there's a whole argument about the Renaissance that says that one of the reasons that it was possible was because of the existence of books. So here's a technology from six, seven hundred years ago, an educational technology invented by educators that had a profound effect on society, including revolutions like the Renaissance and the Reformation, which still we haven't quite figured out. Now, I'm a scientist, so I know that correlation is not causality. And I just ran through uh, about 15 courses in your average undergraduate history curriculum, which I did not take, and which I am not certified to talk about. So I realize this is complicated. Okay? And what I just told you is a very simple story of a very complex phenomenon, but one that I think in a lot of ways parallels where we are today. Okay. However, the bottom line, which I can say decisively, is the universities, textbooks, school structure are old, old technology. And something we invented to deal with a problem, and I would like to propose, is the problem of scalability. How does a growing number of human beings get educated by a small number of human beings, smaller number of human beings? But, and here's the point, there are consequences to the use of any technology. Okay? Technology comes with pluses and minuses no matter what it is. And there are consequences, therefore, for the, this particular technology for education today. Okay? And here are some. And I'd actually challenge you, maybe over the next two or three days, to think as you're talking about this transformation, to talk about what's happening in the digital world with IT, to ask yourself when you're in those conversations, what about the current technology influences the nature of this conversation? Realizing the current technology is really very old. Here's a list that I'll give you a partial list. What are the consequences of teaching children in schools? Right? Small versions of universities. Well, one is that you have to group kids somehow, so you group them by age in a classroom. Does that make sense? Not so sure. Second, one of the things that happen when universities take over education or schools take over education, and it happened in the, in the, in the 1400s, started, and now it's very strong, is it becomes a separation between the use of the education and the education itself. So workforce, training for career, has become largely separated from STEM. The universities talk about math, science, whatever. In the United States, if it's not true in all countries, but in the United States, if you graduate with a PhD or an undergraduate degree in biology, you're not trained to do anything. There's nothing, no one will hire you based on that fact alone. In Brazil, it's not true. 
In Brazil, if you graduate with an undergraduate degree in biology, you're actually can, can be hired as a government worker doing, for example, environmental protection uh, work. But in the United States, it's not true. A lot of our undergraduate degrees, it's sort of a promise that you have a career. You actually haven't been trained for a career. And if I'm sitting in a biology faculty meeting and saying to people, we should start thinking about workforce, they just look at you like you're nuts. Why would we want to do that? It's a student's responsibility to get a job. Why should I worry about it, right? So that's a, there's a, a huge separation between the purpose of education and principle and the way we teach. I think because the teaching part was taken over by an academic discipline. Relevance, therefore, is less clear. It's the standard complaint of students. Students are relatively passive, of course. You guys all have your clickers, which you're not using. And I noticed there haven't been a lot of tweeter, Twitter coming up either. So either it's too early in the morning. There's one. Good. Yeah, I've seen a couple. Um, <clears throat> but it's a passive process. I sit up here and talk, and you sit there and listen. And the more of you are, the harder it is. This technology helps, but still it's hard. Okay. Big emphasis on facts. Textbooks, facts. I mean, how many conversations go on every day about the standards, about what kids need to know? Here's the list of things they need to know. Again, if all you got is biologists in the room, it's easy. If you have a bunch of other people in the room, it gets much harder. Um, <clears throat> teachers become subject matter experts as a consequence. I spent 17 years training teachers in California to teach hands-on science, not textbook-based science, okay, K-8. The biggest thing we had to get around in teaching teachers or getting teachers to teach constructivist inquiry-based learning was you don't have to be an expert anymore. You can introduce the subject without knowing the answer. Okay? I do it all the time. I, know, I was telling Ray earlier, I never teach courses that I know anything about. Because okay? it's boring for me and the students. And of course, learning becomes culturally isolated. Learning is something that happens over there in the school. I mean, I've got a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. I have older kids, too. I'm now going through the schools again. I, work, I give talks all over the world in educational technology. I run a huge website, educational website. The teacher doesn't want to hear about it. <laughs> Definitely does not want to hear about it, OK? It's isolated in that classroom. OK, these are parent-teacher associations, student night once a year. But the parents are not really engaged okay, in the process. What about textbooks? Textbooks, by their nature, are facts, not process-based. They're not about teaching process. It's very hard. The, little, the inserts in the textbooks that say, now you can do this. How many people do that? How often is it doable? Right? Um, <clears throat> single user. A kid with a textbook is all by himself. We are primates. We are social primates. We learn together. Right? Textbooks are not about learning together. They're linear and sequential. Right? One to the next, to the next, to the next. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. And another funny thing about textbooks, the, quest the tests are at the end. Right? A good teacher is assessing constantly the learning of a child. But the textbooks, all you can do is put the t tests at the end. Right? It makes no sense to educate kids that way. A couple of other quick things. Last week I spent, I'll tell you about it in a second, but last week I spent uh, the entire week with someone that developed a major new math curriculum. And one of the questions I asked him is, how much of math curriculum now, K-8 is folklore, and how much of it, the sequence and its structure, is actually based on some sort of a cognitive or quantitative understanding of how best to teach math. His estimate was 70% is folklore, built over hundreds of years. Okay. Subjects. Who says biology, math, physics, and chemistry are separate subjects? If you got to put them in books, they got to be. Are they really? No. I spent most of my career as a computational neurobiologist trying to bring math, physics, chemistry into biology. 
What I'm fighting is this crazy structure we have that says these things are distinct and separate. Okay? Which I think can be related and derived and, and is related to the fact how we organize the way we think, and I think that's been heavily influenced by textbooks. And of course, political, you know where you are. <clears throat> you are in Austin. And uh, Austin is a wonderful city. It doesn't necessarily reflect the politics of Texas as a whole. I think it's fair to say that. And you are probably all aware of the influence that Texas has had on, uh, on the textbook industry, and in particular on what is and is not in textbooks. As soon as textbooks are fact-based and organized by committees and connected to a political system, then all of a sudden it becomes a political entity. And of course, the other thing that happened, and this happened very early on, is that textbooks, be actually in the 1400s, 1300s, textbooks become an industry. $6.2 billion a year is spent in the United States alone on purchasing K-12 textbooks. By the way, how many of you here teach or train elementary school teachers? In how many of those classrooms are the textbooks used? Zero, or close to zero, five. Got five here, five, I see five, ten, two, billions of dollars sitting in the corner, beaming guilt at teachers, All right? There's science over here, you're not teaching science. It's, on a, it's got this beautiful cover, you know, it's all these additional materials not being done. It's amazing. Schools that are stressed for money are spending money on these things that nobody's using. It's just strange. And by the way, does all this work? This is, again, US-centric, and I apologize to the people in the world who are doing much better than we are, <coughs> if you trust the test. But anyway, um, <coughs> so this is actually what happens to US rankings internationally in math and science from elementary school to high school. And in fact, more textbooks are being used in high school than elementary school. So again, as a simple scientist, if you see a graph like this, which is what, about what you care about, and then a graph like that, which is what you're doing, you figure out how to adjust those in principle. So we can now rethink and reinvent what we're doing. We are no longer limited to textbooks and the printing press. We're no longer limited to schools. We have a technology that crosses that border, okay? But it's gonna take real invention. The important point, sometimes I get the sense in talking to my colleagues that some alien brought a computer on the planet to disrupt their normal classroom structure, right? So, <clears throat> I was recently talking at Berkeley, and someone came up to me and said, what do you do about the fact that the kids all bring their, uh, their uh, computers to class? And I said, I make them, put them in the corner. <laughs> right? And uh, if one of them turns them on, they get thrown out of class. What do you think I do? I use them. So what, 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 what computer technology do you use, educational technology? So let me tell you a story. About a year and a half, two years ago, I met with some of the Google guys about education because they were interested in getting education. They wanted some advice. So I asked them a question, okay? What is the most spectacular piece of educational software ever built by miles? Most successful, most influential, okay? They said, uh, SimCity. No, no. Second Life, please, <clears throat> okay? Uh, civilization, no, what is it? Oh, please, PowerPoint. <laughs> yes, it's the Google search engine. They didn't know. Google didn't know. And I told them, what chances are you gonna have any effect on education if you invented it and you don't know you invented it? <laughs> 
The answer to this, I apologize to Apple, is not digital textbooks. It is not. That's digitizing something that's 650 years old. Makes no sense. Because there's a fundamental mismatch between the 14th century technology and our technology. Let me just run through that quickly. Textbooks, linear sequential, digital learning in principle, adaptive. Textbooks, everyone on the same page or in the same chapter. Digital technology in principle, individualized. Textbooks, by necessity, context focused. Digital learning, process focused. Watch a kid use Google. It's amazing. My, my seven year old, it's phenomenal. Okay. Divided artificially by subject. Digital learning correctly done is fully integrated. Slow to adapt. User generated content very quickly adapted, adapting. Lack of immediate relevance. Digital learning properly done is blended between the learning and knowledge worlds and the real world. Okay. Uh, evolved independently of work skills, has become completely independent of workforce skills. Digital technology done properly is fundamentally careers related. I'll talk about that in a second. Textbook is storyboarded. Textbooks are storyboarded. Some committee decides, you start here, and I want you at the end of this book to be here. Or you start in kindergarten, and by the end I want you to do calculus. But it's storyboarded. I figure out how you get from point A to point Z, right? Real digital learning is simulation based, not storyboarded. I think one of the big problems with digital textbooks, and actually with a lot of games that are being built now, supposedly for education, is they're also storyboarded. You know, they're more like Super Mario, which is storyboarded, than they are like chess which I regard as a real game. A huge amount, we're so stuck on storyboard, on how you lead the kid from here to there, and we're building it into games, we're building it into digital technology too, it's not the right thing to do in my opinion. And by the way, it was also Socrates' opinion. <clears throat> Questions at the end? In principle, digital learning can be continuously assessed. Okay, and of course, textbook use is externally motivated. There is occasionally the kid that loves reading the textbook, but they're rare, right? Whereas digital learning properly done is self-motivated. So this is a fundamental shift in pedagogy from textbooks, which is push technology, lectures, push technology, to the internet and digital technology, which in principle is a two-way pull, it's a collaboration. The first is our agenda if we're educators, or their agenda if you're, the, or if you're the victim, to our agenda, collaboratively. This is a fundamental shift. And of course, it means a different relationship between students and teachers, which you all know about, which we're all trying to figure out. How do you do this? I asked a bunch, I gave a talk to a bunch of middle school teachers recently. And I said, how often when you introduce a subject in class does some wise guy already know all about it? And the answer is most of the time. That's new. That didn't happen when I was in middle school. The only person to do about, all about was me. Just kidding. <laughs> the only person who thought he knew all about it was me. That hasn't changed. Anyway, this is, this is new. It's a serious stress for teachers. Okay, some kid that turned out he wanted to become the world's expert on this, and he found using Google he did. By the way, <clears throat> that's me and my two children in 1985, and that's the first uh, virtual world that I built, which was actually in HyperCard, which probably a bunch of those people in this room don't even know. Some do. Okay, and and it was actually a virtual world designed to get kids to read books. And it was, we motivated them through learning to, about animals, and the animals existed on a corn farm. And so the entire project was based on corn farm. Growing corn, exchanging corn, 
Ring any bells? Anyway. Um, <clears throat> what? Five minutes. Okay, good. So I've been doing this simulation virtual world stuff for a long time, looking at new ways to do education. And so I'm going to tell you briefly at the end about Wyville, which is where I've been playing with this now for 14 years, actually back to the mid-80s, if you include Hypercard. Wyville's on its own exponential growth. We're now about 7.2 million registered users, and that's with no marketing. So this is all viral. It's a community. You're welcome to go. We like adults. We actually think adults, interacting between adults and kids is good. Um, so you're welcome to go. As I said, there's 7.2 million users. Average age 13, about 72% currently are girls. And Wyville mixes all of these different forms of education together. It's really a simulated world. It mixes STEM and careers, formal and informal learning, play and learning, gaming and assessment, and gaming and teacher professional development. The talk I was going to give that I didn't, was about the relationship between those two things. What happens if the way that kids learn is by playing games, simulation-based games, the way teachers learn is by playing simulation-based games, the simulation-based games are instrumented, so you actually know what the kids are doing and what they know, and that, instrument, that data, the metrics from the instrument, feeds back into teacher professional development. What happens then? I would happily tell you about that. That's where things are headed, I believe. So here are a couple of challenges we were asked to confront in Wyville, just to give you a sense for how this works. There's something called the Encyclopedia of Life, which is an encyclopedia of all living species. Okay? It's a fascinating subject built by academics and libraries, biology libraries. It's a fascinating website if you happen to be interested in species. The problem with your, they came to us and said, we'd like to have kids use this website. The problem is it's living species. We told them, can you add dinosaurs? They said, no. So well, it turns out kids are more interested in dead things than living things. <laughs> Sorry, it's living species. OK, so what do you do? In Wyville, we build a simulated coral reef called the Y Reef, where kids can float around. It's beautiful, because coral reefs are beautiful. These are the kids floating around, and they have these little recorders. And they use the recorders to actually characterize which species are there using the Encyclopedia of Life. Without knowing it, we actually made one of the two reefs sick. Okay, the kids realized that because they were collecting data, and it turns out in one of the reefs that the largest fish were disappearing. This created a huge crisis in Wyville. Our reef is dying. Okay, they went to the Wyville Senate. You have to do something. The Senate is elected by the kids. Okay, you have to do something about the reef. It's dying. What do we do? Well, we have to figure out what the problem is. Well, it turns out there was a trawler floating over the reef catching fish, the big fish. And so the Senate, after a lot of debate and discussion by the kids, decided to actually pass a law that said you couldn't fish over the reefs anymore. Okay? This goes on. I don't have time to tell you about it. But this is data after two months. Okay? 2.3 million visits to the reef. 22 million efforts to characterize the species of fish and 1.2 million, 1.1 million different species identifications. And 2.3 million clams, which is Wyville's currency, virtual currency, raised to try to save the reef. We don't have taxation in Wyville. The federal government doesn't tax. The kids actually donate for causes they care about. I suggested that to the IRS director recently. It didn't. <laughs> Actually, I was at, you know, the, the, the Obama administration is quite interested in games and gaming, and there was, he was giving a whole talk about how it would be really cool to use games in education. I said, well, you know, you should use them in the federal government, too. He said, well, can you give me an example? I said, sure, we're all playing a game, right? April 15th, we play the game. How about you guys actually make a game into a real game? Right? It'd be much more interesting, and he didn't like that idea. Anyway, if you're interested, 
in reading about the Y Reef project, there was actually a recent report or case study, which I'd be happy to send you if you're interested in, which talks about the following question. How do you really have serious scientific content in games? Another challenge, books are good, by the way. Textbooks are bad, books are good, right? So we've actually been working with the Great Books Foundation, encouraging kids to read great books. Who knew that Beauty and the Beast, written in 1740, was really about avatar-based virtual worlds, in which your appearance can be anything you want, but your substance is more important. So our children are reading Beauty and the Beast and think it's about Wyville. That author was really smart. Talk about a futurist, right? Last one. So complex challenges, relevance to careers, energy. Have you ever noticed, it's curious, if you look on the internet, oil derricks are always at sunset. That, just look, Google oil derricks. They're always pictures of sunset, and for some reason, the uh, wind turbines are always sunrise. But anyway, so this is a project that involves, uh, 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 it's called Y Power. It involves uh, Power Across Texas with a nonprofit ed energy education uh, organization in Texas. Da Vinci Mines, and actually Cliff Zinkraff is going to be talking at the EduCause session this afternoon, and the Texas Workforce Commission, in which kids are now managing the Yville power grid, learning to run power plants learning which power plants they should run and shouldn't, learning how to construct houses that are efficient, learning how to in install HAVC, involved in energy entrepreneurship where they can actually pay for and place wind turbines and solar arrays in different parts of Wyville to be able to power Wyville. By the way, Wyville is the only virtual world where the continued growth of the site is having serious environmental consequences. Our carbon dioxide amounts are going up and we're on the verge of brownouts all the time. Made worse by the fact that we now the power grid is being managed by children. <laughs> this is a curriculum which has been developed over the last two years by Da Vinci Mines for seventh and eighth grade which assumes Wyville. Wyville is not an add-on to this curriculum. It assumes you're in Wyville. And the classroom is then used to improve kids' performance in Wyville. Okay? We like said uh, another interesting thing about this talk about linkages, and I'll be done in just a second. Um, <clears throat> once kids identify that they want to be an HAVC installer, they think that's cool in seventh grade. This project links them to career counselors in community colleges. So that a 10-year-old can say, how do I get from being 10 to here? By the way, in middle school, there's no other source of that information. And increasingly, in high schools, there's no source of that information. Okay, the community colleges are very good at this. So we're linking community college counselors to Wyville. And if a kid's interested in a career path, we tell them how to get there. As I said, this is going to be discussed, I think, Cliff Zinkraft, who's at Da Vinci Minds, is going to be on a panel this afternoon with the EDUCAUSE panel. And finally, Okay. We are now working on a project with EDC to uh, wivelize uh, a math curriculum. It's based on puzzles, turning math curriculum into puzzles, and the initial version of it will actually be involve the mathematics of mobiles. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be interesting. So finally, I'm a computational neuroscientist. And in the abstract, it said something about me talking about primates, which I, I think is stra always, always strange talking to primates about primates. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to do that just for a second. I said I'm a computational neuroscientist, which means that I've been blending math and science and biology and computation all together for years. That's actually me on the rat sticking a Purkinje cell, which I love to do. And the guy, Pancho Sanza there on, my, uh, on, the, on the cart behind me are my poor graduates, long-suffering graduate students. So <clears throat> I can tell you that neuroscience is very slowly reaching a consensus about how learning works. So I've almost never used this card, 
the neuroscience car, but I'm talking about education because I don't want to mislead you into thinking we know much more about the brain than we actually do. But this is sort of some of the information that's ideas that are now percolating in the computational neuroscience community about learning. Learning is a process of reshaping one's own personal memory. The, re the re learning has to be active, not passive. So it's not about absorbing facts. It's about restructuring your own memory and your own understanding. Reshaping has to be an active process. Truth is constructed shape of knowledge, not its content. And this kind of learning requires active mentoring this is what neuroscience is converging on. I'm now about to give an answer to the test. Who said this first? Socrates. After 2,000 years plus, neuroscience is slowly converging on what Socrates somehow figured out. Right? So the bottom line is, how we learn is not new. I'm often asked, how has technology changed the way we learn? The way we learn changes over evolutionary time, not over technology time. It's not changing how we learn. We finally have built an inventable, scalable, primate learning technology. Finally. It's taken a while which means we can now reinvent education for the next 600 years. But the legacy of the last 600 years we are still living with. We need to understand that legacy. We need to keep what's good, which I would claim is not much, and we need to use the new technology, the new capability we have, to really figure out how to do this right, and looking at history helps, and reading Plato helps, and uh, I didn't see that on the agenda, but I, next year I hope it'll be there. So thank you very much for listening. <clears throat>